welcome back to uh, part two of the geoengineering, uh, the regulations of geoengineering. Um, I'm going to start uh, about uh, the categories of geoengineering. This chapter examines what technologies and techniques could be classed as geoengineering and what can and should be regulated. As we explained in the previous chapters, we use the term geoengineering to describe activities specifically, specifically and deliberately uh, designed to affect a change in the global climate with the aim of minimizing or reversing anthropogenic climate change. Um, we are examining geoengineering exclusively in relation to climate change. Our start point is again our earlier report, Engineering Turning Ideas into Reality. Um, I will try to find that report too. I think I have it somewhere, but I didn't exactly read it. So, <coughs> uh, nothing more to uh, tell about that report unless it's in this report. Uh, along with the Royal Society report, geoengineering, the climate science, governance and uncertainty, and uncertainty, the definition of geoengineering. Geoengineering is not, however, a monolithic subject. Geoengineering methods are diverse and vary greatly in terms of their technological heuristics, heuristics and possibly consequences. They can be and were by those who submitted evidence to us classified into two main groups carbon dioxide removal, the CDR techniques, and solar radiation management, the SRM techniques. Well, let's go talk first about the carbon dioxide removal, sorry, carbon dioxide removal, the CDR techniques. Uh, CDR removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Proposal in this category includes techniques. A. Techniques for enhancing natural carbon sinks, the oceans, the forests, rocks and soil, and sequestration of, uh, sorry, sequ uh, sequestration of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, Atmos atmospheric scrubbing, by chemical means. Chemical, that's bad. <laughs> I don't have chemicals in my air. With captured carbon deposited in deep ocean or geological structures. What I mean with chemicals, I don't want uh, human made chemicals, you know, the nasty stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. Examples for of CDR techniques the bioengineering with carbon dioxide capture and sequestration. Bags, biomass may have. Uh, may be harvested and used as fuel with capture uh, and sequestration of the resulting carbon dioxide, for example, the use of biomass to make hydrogen or electricity and sequester the resulting carbon dioxide in geological formations. Biomass and biochar as fact, biomass and biochar as the fact, oh my god. Uh, biomass and biochar. It's a next cha the next chapter. As vegetation effect, vegetation grows, vegetation, how hard is it to talk, right? Um, it removes large quantities of carbon from the atmosphere during photosynthesis. Uh, ph photosynthesis. When the organisms die and decompose, most of the carbon they store it returned to the atmosphere. The several ways in which the growth of biomass may be harnessed to slow the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide. For instance, biomass may be harvested and sequestered um, as an organic material, for example, by buying tree or burying trees uh, or crop waste or as charcoal, biochar. Uh, Enhanced watering, land and ocean based methods. Carbon dioxide is naturally removed from the atmosphere over many thousands of years by processing involving the weathering dissolution of carbonate and silicate rocks. Silicate mineral, uh, minerals uh, form the most common rocks on Earth and they react with carbon dioxide to form carbonates. 
thereby consume carbon dioxide. Um, next part is ocean fertilization. Phytoplankton, phytoplankton, I don't know exactly how to pronounce that, but it's plankton time. Uh, take up carbon dioxide and fix it up as biomass. When the organisms die, a small fractation of this captured carbon sinks into the deep ocean. Proponents of the ocean fertilization schemes have argued that by fertilizing the oceans, it may be possible to increase phytoplankton growth and thus associated carbon removal. Ocean fertilization schemes involve the addition of nutrients to the ocean, the addition of nutrients to the ocean, soluble iron, for example, uh, or the red redistribution of nutrients extant in the deeper ocean to increase, increase productivity, such as through ocean pipes. So, you basically want to fertilize the ocean floors to grow plankton, and um, they want to do that in a way they. Um, transport oil and gas and all the other stuff over the ocean floors with big pipes and shit and, and when an earthquake quantum comes and the pipeline bursts and all the fertilizer goes out and all kinds of over fertilization and everything will die. Very great plants if you ask me. <coughs> um, next Phase, ocean and NP fertilization, that's phosphate and nitrogen, the NNP. Over the majority of the o uh, open oceans, the limiting nutrient is thought to be nitrogen. One suggestion, therefore, has been to add a sur source of fixed nitrogen, N, between two hooks, N for nitrogen. Such as uh, urea as an ocean fertilizer, phosphate is also close to limiting over much of the ocean. So that's that for the ocean fertilization and all kinds of stuff. Now we have a table um, they give us, uh, which draws from the Royal Society report, compares the cost and environmental impact of CDR methods. methods. Um, I will call up the techniques, the costs, uh, the impact, the anticipated environmental effects and risk of unanticipated environmental effects. It will go from low, medium to, uh, I think, high. Yes, high. Uh, the land use and afforestation. The cost is low, the impact, what they anticipate is low and risk is low. Well, that's what they say. Uh, the biomass with carbon sequestration is uh, cost is medium, the impact is medium, and the risk of unanticipated environmental effects is medium. Biomass and biochar uh, costs are medium, impact is medium, the risk uh, of unanticipated environmental effects is medium. Enhanced watering on land. The costs are medium, the impacts are medium, and the risks are low. Low. Right. Enhanced weathering, increasing ocean alkalinity, that's the yeah, power, uh, yeah, basically the alkalinity, the, the EC, I think you call it. Uh, could be wrong, please correct me if I am. Um, cost is medium, impacts are medium, the risks are medium. Uh, <coughs> chemical air capture and carbon sequestration. The costs are whole, uh, high. I'm sorry. Uh, impacts are low and risk of unanticipated environmental effects are low. Ocean fertilization. The costs are low, the impacts are medium, and the risk of unanticipated environmental effects are high. Now, uh, later on this re in this report, um, they are saying the UK and the US are already testing with the ocean fertilization. So basically, uh, one of the highest, uh, one with uh, the most uh, risk of unanticipated environmental effects, and they are already testing it and, and playing with it in their oceans. It's bad. Now the ocean and uh, nitrate and phosphate fertilization. 
the costs are medium and the impacts might be medium and risks are high again high it's not good now um, I think that's for now um, part two the next part we will talk about uh, um, Demic, where is it? Solar radiation management. Uh, yes, solar radiation management. I'll see you in the next part.